Uh, welcome everyone to today's multi-agent systems talk. Uh, my name is Stef Stefan Albrecht. Uh, I organize these sessions with uh, uh, Professor Michael Woodridge from Oxford University. And this is part of uh, the Alan Turing Institute multi-agent systems uh, initiative. So I'll just give you some, uh, just a couple of slides to share with you to give you some background information. Right, so this all started with a um, symposium that we organized back in uh, February 2020, took place at the Alan Turing HQ in London. Uh, we had uh, over 100 uh, delegates coming from uh, across the UK and Ireland, representing the various labs in the UK and at the universities, industry and defense, who have a deep interest in multi-agent systems research. And the idea was that, um, you know, there's a lot of work, really interesting work happening in multi-agent systems research across the UK. And the UK has historically been one of the, uh, one, a major contributor in this area. But over the past years, um, the area has become really fragmented and it's become a little hard to keep track of who's doing what and who's who. So we thought uh, the Turing Institute would be in a good place to provide a national meeting platform to bring people together uh, shake hands and find out what's happening. So that's why we organized this event. And it was uh, very interesting. We had lots of people sharing their research agendas. And this had very positive feedback. And there were uh, three main things that came out of this. Um, basically, we, we had this uh, symposium and it also um, generated some follow-up ideas such as the talk series that we're doing now. Uh, and we're hoping to do another symposium uh, perhaps next year or whenever the conditions allow us to do this again. Uh, another outcome of this meeting was that we created this virtual uh, map on uh, on Google Maps where we try to pin down all the uh, major labs in the UK that have an interest in multi-agent systems research. So if you can go on this page and you find the map and then you can click on the pins and you see uh, the lab PIs, university research focus and, and all this information and you can get in touch with labs. Uh, and then we also generated a mailing list, which you can see here, and this can be used by everyone uh, who has an interest in multi-agent systems research to share relevant opportunities. For example, um, conferences, uh, job opportunities, competitions, and all this. So you see, you can see the uh, URL for the webpage at the bottom of the slide. Uh, and lastly, I, I wanted, uh, uh, just let you know that we record these talks and we have a dedicated channel on YouTube where we upload these talks. You can see you can see it here and you can just go on YouTube and search for a Turing multi-agent and then you should be able to find it and, and you can watch the videos and, and share them. And today's video will be recorded as well. So with that, uh, I'm really happy to uh, have today with us Professor Shimon Weitzen and uh, Tabish. Um, hold on a sec, make sure I say it right. Tabisha Rashid from the Whiteson Research Lab at the Department of Computer Science at the University of Oxford. And I'll just uh, hand over to them. If you want to put up your slides, I'll stop sharing my own. And then you can get started. So welcome uh, to today's talk and I'm really pleased to have you here. Thanks, um, Stefano. Can you hear me okay? Yep, can hear you loud and clear. Uh, okay, and you can see my slides? Yep, looks good. Okay, great, uh, let's get started. Thanks very much um, for the introduction and for the invitation to speak today. Um, it's really a pleasure to, to be here and to have the chance to tell you a bit about some of our work on uh, multi-agent reinforcement learning. Um, so presumably I don't need to explain uh, to this audience the importance of multi-agent systems. Um, but this talk focuses entirely on cooperative multi-agent systems, and in particular, how to do cooperative multi-agent reinforcement learning. And the cooperative setting is all about solving coordination problems, how to get a team of agents to work together to achieve a common goal. So this setting is important because a large number of these real-world multi-agent systems are cooperative, like a team of robots in a warehouse, or they contain subgroups that can be usefully modeled as such like a fleet of self-driving cars sharing uh, public roads with human drivers. Now, before we can get into some of the methods that we've developed, we have to get clear on the exact problem setting. And this is a common source of confusion because once you depart from the simplicity of the single agent setting, 
there's an explosion of possible settings, each with different assumptions about the agents, what they can observe, what actions they can take, how they're rewarded, and so on. In fact, at one point, I got so frustrated with people misunderstanding our problem setting that I asked uh, Jacob Forster, who at the time was a PhD student in my group, can you make a single slide that just clearly encapsulates the problem setting that we're focusing on? So this is the slide that he made. You can judge for yourself whether he succeeded. The setting, of course, is multi-agent and cooperative, as I've already discussed. It's also partially observable, which means each agent has its own private and partial view of the global state. And as we'll see, this turns out to be crucial because it's this partial observability that makes the setting truly multi-agent. In addition, we require that the policies learned by the agents can be executed in a decentralized fashion, which means each agent conditions only on its history of private observations, not those of the other agents. However, we assume that the learning takes place in a simulator or in another safe setting like a laboratory, such that the learning process itself can be centralized. So the agents, they can share parameters, observations, gradients, whatever they want. There are no rules as long as the resulting policies are amenable to decentralized execution. So to formalize this problem setting, let's start with the basics, the single agent MVP. I'll assume that you're familiar with it, but let me just note that in our notation, the action is denoted with U, um, as A will later be used to refer to the agent. So we have transitions and reward functions. The return is a discounted sum of rewards and value functions represent conditional ex expected returns. Okay, now the simplest way to make this setting multi-agent is to just add a separate action space for each agent. So every agent sees the global state, but it can select its own action. So A in the superscript here indicates which agent is taking the action. The transition and reward functions are the same as before, but now they condition on the joint action, which is a vector of action choices of each agent. So I'm using bold here to indicate vectors. Now, as you may have already noticed, there's nothing fundamentally multi-agent about the multi-agent MVP. We can think of it as just a single agent MVP with a factored action space. In other words, taking an action means specifying a whole vector as if a single puppeteer agent was controlling all the robots or whatever from above. Uh, so that is why partial observability is crucial to making the, the uh, setting truly multi-agent as this can be modeled with a de and, and this can be modeled with a decentralized partially observable Markov decision process or DEC POMDP. So in addition to the elements already introduced, we have an observation function that conditions not only on the global state, but on the agent, such that each agent has in general a different private and partial view of the world. And due to partial observability, the agents will generally want to condition on their entire action observation history tau. And learning aims to produce a set of decentralized policies in which each agent doesn't condition on anything besides its private history. So this constraint can be motivated in two ways. There's what I call the natural decentralization in which real world communication or sensory constraints require decentralization. But there's also artificial decentralization in which no such constraints exist inherently, but we as the designers artificially impose them in order to make learning more tractable by, for example, forcing each agent to consider only a local field of view. And of course, as I've mentioned, we're performing centralized learning of decentralized policies. So we can do whatever we like during training as long as the result is a set of policies that obey this decentralization constraint. And I've become a bit of an evangelist for this setting because a core belief of mine is that to make progress on hard problems, we have to make the right assumptions. So we're looking for assumptions that give us a lot of leverage on the problem, but which still mostly or approximately hold in the real world. And this assumption meets these criteria, in, in my opinion. We don't deploy robots tabula rasa, we train them in the simulator or in a laboratory first, and centralizing that process is a powerful tool for learning coordinated behavior among cooperative agents. Okay, so the simplest approach we can take algorithmically is called independent learning. This was first proposed as independent Q learning way back in 93. And the idea is that each agent simply learns independently with its own Q function that conditions on its private observation history and individual action. So nothing is centralized. There's no attempt to learn a joint value function that conditions on the joint action. 
And each agent essentially treats the other agents as if they were part of the environment. Of course, we can do the same thing with an actor-critic approach where each agent has its own actor and critic. If we have centralized learning, then an obvious improvement is to share parameters across agents during learning, which can speed learning and improve generalization. So the agents can still behave differently because they receive different inputs, and those inputs can even include an agent index, so the agents can behave arbitrarily heterogeneously. Now, it's natural to ask whether such learning should still be called independent, but it is still independent in the important sense that the value functions condition only on private observations and individual actions with no joint value functions. Now, obviously this is a naive approach. A key limitation is that because each agent treats other agents as part of the environment, if those agents are also learning, then the environment from that agent's perspective becomes non-stationary and convergence guarantees go out the window. In addition, because there's no attempt to learn a joint value function, the sort of synergistic value of coordination is not represented, which makes it hard to learn coordinated behavior. So one way we can do better is to take an actor-critic approach and to centralize the critic. So the critic conditions on the global state, the joint history, maybe even the joint action. And centralizing the critic makes sense because it's only needed during training. Once you deploy, you can discard the critic and just use the policies to act. Anything that you discard before deployment is a great candidate for centralization. This also makes explicit the motivation for taking an actor-critic approach because actor-critic methods are appealing anytime you have what I call a hard greedification problem. That is, when finding the greedy action with respect to the value function is non-trivial. So the classic example is continuous action spaces, and this is the, the typical setting in which actor-critic methods are used. But here we have another hard greedification problem because we have a centralized value function from which we need to derive decentralized policies. So actor-critic methods can do that by having each actor independently update its policy by following a policy gradient estimated from the same centralized critic, which is what's shown in this figure. Um, however, learning a centralized value function over a complex action space can be challenging. So a crucial idea to address this is to learn factored value functions instead. So factor value functions have a long history in reinforcement learning and an even longer one in decision theoretic planning. The idea is to represent the value function as a sum of local value functions, each of which depends on the observed actions and observations of only a subset of the agents. So this can be modeled in a coordination graph, which is just a factor graph where the factors are the local value functions and the variables are the agents. Just like a probabilistic graphical model, a coordination graph captures conditional independence properties. So here, for example, agent one, if agent one knows the action of agent two, it can select its own action without caring what agent three does. So such a factorization reduces the number of parameters to be learned, thereby speeding learning and improving generalization. It also makes it tractable to maximize over the joint action space since your favorite message passing algorithms for performing map inference in probabilistic graphical models can be reused to efficiently find the maximizing joint action. Um, now, as is often the case, DeepMind was the first to deep learnify this idea in an approach that they called value decomposition networks. So VDN uses the most extreme form of, um, the most extreme form of factorization with um, one factor per agent yielding this disconnected factor graph. Um, now, while this is obviously a highly restrictive uh, factorization, it has an important side effect of enabling a total decentralization of the max and argmax. Because each factor involves only one agent, we can compute the max over joint actions by just performing a max over each agent's individual action space independently and then summing them. Similarly, we can compute the global argmax by performing a separate argmax for each agent and then compiling the resulting actions into a vector. What this means is that in a VDN factorization, we no longer have a hard greedification problem. Finding the greedy action with respect to a value function is easy again, so we are no longer compelled to take an actor critic approach. We can just use Q learning. So here we have a DQN loss function where the Q function is centralized. Thanks to the VDN factorization, this maximization can be formed, performed efficiently and on deployment, action selection 
trivially decentralizes since it requires only the decentralized argmax that I just discussed. So this brings us at last to QMix, which is a method that we developed a few years ago and that has proved quite useful in practice in this setting. The main idea was to try to preserve this handy property of decentralizing the argmax while loosening the restrictive representation imposed by BDN's extreme factorization. So we can do that by leveraging the simple observation that to preserve the decentralizability of the argmax, it suffices to enforce the condition that for all agents, the partial derivative of the joint value function with respect to that agent's individual value function is non-negative. Now, one potential source of confusion here is that because we're considering discrete action spaces, these individual Q values are only defined for a set of discrete points. So what does it even mean to take the derivative with respect to it? So this figure illustrates what's really happening. When we compute the centralized value function from the individual values, we do so using a mixing function, which we can think of as taking real valued continuous inputs. So the color gradient shown here shows a mixing function that obeys the monotonicity constraint I just discussed. It's this mixing function whose partial derivatives must be non-negative in order to obey the monotonicity constraint. In VDN, the mixing function is just a summation, but the point is that any monotonic function will do. Of course, in practice, the monotonic function is only ever supplied with the discrete set of inputs corresponding to the individual Q values for each agent's action, which thanks to the monotonicity constraint can be individually maximized over. Okay, so when the students in my lab first pitched this idea to me, I was pretty skeptical. In fact, I was convinced it would never work. My reasoning was that if you preserve the decentralizability of the argmax, then you are still saddled with the key limitation of EDN, which is that it can't represent the benefit of coordination. By definition, if each agent can select its action in a vacuum, then there won't be any benefit to coordinating with other agents. So this point is illustrated with the normal form games shown here. So on the left, we have a game whose value function is both linear and monotonic. So both VDN and QMix can represent it. In the middle, we have a game that is nonlinear, but still monotonic. So QMix can represent this, but VDN cannot. And on the right, you have a game that is both nonlinear and non-monotonic, so neither VDN nor QMix can represent it. And my point was that only the game on the right involves coordination because only there does one agent's choice depend on the other agent's choice. So the question then becomes, should we care about these games in the middle? Because it's these games that QMix can represent better than VDN. And my claim was not really, because even if VDN couldn't represent the games in the middle exactly, it could still approximate it with a value function from the left game and when we perform greedy action selection, we would get exactly the same results as we would with QMix. Um, so I thought that was a pretty good argument, but um, the students had uh, an insight that I had overlooked. And their point was that the value function is not just used for action selection, it's also used for bootstrapping. So the loss is a mean squared error between the Q value and a target, and that target is computed by bootstrapping off the Q value in the next state, as shown in red. So even if a monotonic mixing function doesn't select different actions than a linear mixing function in a given state, it can better estimate the value at that state, which results in less bootstrapping error and better action selection in earlier states. So um, this is a, a two-step game that illustrates this point. So in the first step, the red uh, agent's action is irrelevant, and the blue agent's action determines whether, in the second step, they go to state 2A or 2B. In 2A, the payoff is 7 regardless of their actions, while in 2B, the payoff is 8, but only if they select the right action. So let's see what happens when we apply VDN and QMix to this game. VDN can accurately represent the value of 2A, but not 2B. In 2B, it correctly identifies the best action, but underestimates its value. Crucially, 
these errors in 2B propagate back via bootstrapping to result in errors in the value function in the first step, leading the blue agent to suboptimally choose to transition to 2A. By contrast, QMix can represent both 2A and 2B correctly, which via bootstrapping leads to lower error in the value function in the first step, and so the blue agent optimally chooses to transition to 2B. Okay, so how do we actually enforce the monotonicity constraint? QMix does this by using three networks, an agent network, a mixing network, and a hyper network. The middle part of this figure shows the basic setup. The agent net networks, which share parameters, produce the individual Q values. These are then fed into the mixing network, which is constrained to have non-negative weights to ensure monotonicity, and produces the joint Q value. On the right, we have a closer look at the agent network, which is just a conventional deep network with feed forward and recurrent layers. On the left, we have a closer look at the mixing network, whose weights are not learned directly, but instead specified as the output of a separate hyper network that conditions not only on the individual Q values, but on the global state, which is allowed because we only use the mixing network in the training phase. The reason for the hyper networks is to allow the value function to more flexibly condition on this global state. Without the mixing network, the relationship between the state and the value would have to be uh, not uh, monotonic because of the non-negative weights. With a hyper network, QMix can, in principle, specify an arbitrarily different mixing function for every state. And then in the execution phase, we discard the mixing network and each agent selects actions greedily with respect to its individual Q values, which thanks to the monotonicity constraint is guaranteed to maximize the joint Q function. Okay. So now in these plots, we see the max over the estimated Q values of nine random matrix gains for both QMix and VDN compared to the true max shown in the dashed line. And these plots show essentially that the students were right. QMix is consistently better than VDN at approximating the max over the Q values. And this is the quantity that in a sequential setting would be used for bootstrapping. Of course, that's just a sanity check. So for a proper evaluation of QMix, we use the StarCraft Multi-Agent Challenge or SMAC, which is a suite of cooperative multi-agent RL benchmarks that we created based on the popular real-time strategy game, StarCraft II. As we know from supervised learning and from single agent reinforcement learning, good benchmarks are really important for driving progress. So that's why we created SMAC and open sourced it along with PyMarl, which is a software engineering framework that includes implementations of our and other key moral algorithms. Um, now in StarCraft, human players compete against each other or against the game AI to gather resources, build armies and buildings and defeat opponents. Um, now you've probably heard about AlphaStar, which is DeepMind's StarCraft playing agent. Um, it also uses StarCraft II, but the setting is actually only superficially similar to SMAC. Um, AlphaStar considers the full game uh, with a centralized policy and a single puppeteer agent that directs all the units, like in a multi-agent MVP. Uh, but it also has competitive aspects because it uses self-play techniques to train against like a suite of evolving opponents. In SMAC, we're trying to benchmark deck pom DPs, so we consider only a micromanagement in StarCraft, the fine-grained control of in individual units, um, and the setting is fully cooperative because we fix the opponent's AI, the, the opponent's policy to that of the game AI, and most importantly, there's no puppeteer, but instead each unit is controlled by a separate agent. Now, as we know, to be truly multi-agent, we need partial observability, which SMAC introduces by limiting the site range of each agent as shown in the figure. Um, now, SMAC consists of a number of different maps, which are shown here. We have symmetric maps where both teams have the same type and number of agents. We have maps where both teams have the same type of agents, but the opponent has more of them. And we have asymmetric maps where the two teams have different types of agents. Um, now, in the original QMix paper, we just reported results on a few maps. But now that we have SMAC, we can evaluate across 14 different maps. I don't want to bore you with dozens of plots. So I'll just show you this one sort of summary plot, which shows the number of maps out of 14 for which each method has the best performing policy at each time during training. And again, the students were right. QMix's richer mixing function really pays off. The hump in the middle indicates that QMix tends to learn faster than the other methods. While, and while those other methods eventually catch up on a few maps, 
The right part of the figure shows that QMIX often learns substantially better final policies. So notice that to have the best policy on a map, we require it to be epsilon better than the alternative. So even when QMIX is not winning on a map, that doesn't imply that it's losing. Typically, it just means it's tying because there's, there's some very difficult maps on which none of the methods uh, make a lot of progress. Now, the alternatives the methods, they include independent Q learning and VDN, as well as COMA, which is an actor critic method that we also developed. Um, right. Um, OK, so let's take a closer look at uh, the factors that contribute to QMix's performance. So here are the results of some ablation experiments where we compare QMix to VDN and QMix NS, in which the mixing function does not condition on the global state, and VDNS, in which VDN includes a state-dependent bias in its linear mixing. So the plots show that the median test win percentage across independent runs for each method uh, throughout training on three different maps. So these results show that conditioning on the state is an important factor in performance, at least on some maps, and that doing so with a state-dependent bias is not as good as the most flexible, more flexible approach in QMix, which involves a hypernet. So here we have another ablation experiment where we compare QMix to QMix lin, where the mixing function is restricted to be one linear layer. And again, we're plotting median test win percentage. As expected, um, the original QMix with nonlinear mixing performs noticeably better. Okay, but here's where things get weird. If we actually look at the learned mixing functions, they look very close to being linear. We've done this analysis on a number of maps, but I'm showing here an example on the uh, two Colossi 64 Zergling maps, because it's obviously easier to visualize when there are only two agents. So the left shows the mixing function for the, individual, for the initial state, and the right shows it for the state at time step 50. So, um, but what's going on here? To figure it out, we created yet another ablation that we call QMix 2 lin which like QMix has two layers in its mixing function, but like QMix lin has only linear layers. Now, your machine learning textbook will tell you that putting linear layers on top of each other won't increase representational capacity because a linear combination of linear functions is still just a linear function. However, what your textbook won't mention, but is probably obvious to any deep learning practitioner, is that adding such layers can greatly affect the learning dynamics, often favorably. Um, so that's what's illustrated in this plot. This is not actually an RL experiment. It's just a regression task of predicting fixed Q values. So the y-axis is just a mean squared error. And you can see that QMix2 lin learns much faster than QMix lin, even though they both have linear mixing. And it even matches the performance of QMix with nonlinear mixing. And sure enough, this result holds up uh, in SMAC when we actually do RL. So the performance of QMix and QMix lin are quite similar and substantially better than that of QMix lin when we again consider median test win percentage. Now, um, we can try to encourage QMix to learn nonlinear mixing functions by changing the activation function from LU to tan H. And indeed, we do see more nonlinearity in the learned mixing functions as shown in the top here. However, as the bottom plots show, the effect on performance is modest at best. OK, so the, the takeaways from these experiments are value fu function factorization is highly effective in these tasks. Flexibly conditioning on the state, not just using a state-dependent bias, is also important. And it's important to richly parameterize the mixing function as VDN or even QMix with a single linear layer is not sufficient. However, much as we might wish it was otherwise, nonlinear mixing does not seem to be important, at least not in SMAC. OK, I'm going to turn it over to Tabish now, who's going to talk about um, some more recent developments and how we can make QMix even better. Thank you. I'm just going to quickly share my slides. Cool. I hope everyone can see that just fine and hear me. Yes. Okay, good. All right, so revisiting a point that Shimod made earlier in the talk, that the monotonic mixing of QMix cannot capture or represent coordination, how important is this in general? 
We've seen that in SMAC, Cubic's performs really well despite this. However, what are the consequences of not being able to represent coordination in our Q values? And what I mean by representing coordination, the ability to the Q values in which an agent's best action can depend on the actions of the other agents, as Shimo mentioned before. So overall, we know that QMix cannot represent all possible joint action Q values. Now, this limitation can have quite catastrophic consequences in the following example from the QTRAN paper. So on the left is a quite simple matrix game with two agents in three actions. And we can see what QMix learns on the right, fails to recover the correct argmax and severely underestimates the maximum Q value in the top left. Now, considering that the ability to recover the correct argmax and accurately estimate the maximum Q value are crucial for Q learning, this suggests that maybe we should be at least a little bit worried about this sort of thing. But how worried should we be? Can we simply rectify all of this by using a bigger network, a fancier optimizer, smart learning rates, for instance? And the answer is, is no. So this limitation is a cause for concern because it really is a fundamental part of QMix. And it arises as a consequence of the factorization that we deliberately chose to use. This fundamental part is important because this limitation is really baked deep into the algorithm. We cannot get around it by using bigger networks, more training, more compute. QMix simply cannot represent all joint action Q. So let's try and understand what is going wrong in some more detail. So what we want to do is we want to try and pinpoint exactly where QMix fails so that we can think about how to improve it. And so to do so, let's consider an idealized version of QMix in the form of an operator. We're interested in this idealized version specifically because we want to try and isolate these fundamental parts of QMix. And by taking an operator outlook, we can sidestep all issues of exploration, compute, architectures, and general deep learning function approximation hardness. Now, our operator TQMix here, we define as the composition of the standard Bellman optimality operator and our QMix specific projection operator. So essentially, we first compute the targets and then we project them into the space of joint action key values that QMix can represent. And then our important projection operator is shown at the bottom here. And we define it as the Q in the space of things that QMix can represent that minimizes the squared loss with our target Q values that we're trying to represent. So in this setup, the projection operator is really the important thing that's actually specific to QMix. And if we try and think about what the projection is doing, we can see that it is weighting the errors for all the joint actions equally. And hence, for this matrix game, we end up misrepresenting the Q value for the optimal action in the top left. And what this tells us, at least for this very specific, very helpful example, is that under this setup, it's more important to get the Q values for the bad minus 12 entries correct, as opposed to being correct about the optimal actions Q value. And then this is all because there are more of these minus 12s. And ultimately, this projection is only interested in the total squared error. So hypothetically, um, what would happen if we knew the optimal joint action and we only considered its error in our projection? So for a single joint action, the representational limitations of QMix, they really have no effect. And so we're able to correctly estimate the Q value with no problem. In general, though, we won't know the optimal joint action and we're going to need to be estimating the Q values for all of these joint actions in some manner anyway. Now, ideally, we want to learn Q values for the other joint actions that aren't going to impact our optimal joint actions Q value and that are hopefully reasonably correct in some way. So based on that intuition, let's, let's introduce a weighting function into our objective so that we can adjust how important the error is for specific joint actions. So in our projection, this means that we introduce a function w, so quite simply like this. Now, importantly, this weighting only changes the Q values that are returned from our projection operator. We're still operating within the same class of joint action Q. We're still restricted by what QMix can represent. However, by introducing this weighting, we can change the Q that we do learn so that they have better properties. The two important ones being that the correct argmax is returned and the correct maximum Q value is learned. 
So we considered two different weighting functions, which aim to try and place a larger weighting on the better joint actions. The first shown here is the idealized central weighting, which is not a practical weighting since it requires access to the true arc max, which we don't have. We put a weight of one on the true optimal joint action and a smaller weight alpha on everything else. Now, of course, if we already knew the arc max, we wouldn't need to bother with all of this, but this is really just meant as a tool for theoretical analysis. And in our experiments, we approximate it appropriately. The second weighting is the optimistic weighting, which is very nice and easy to use in experiments, but perhaps isn't as obviously correct as the previous weighting. So if Q mixes Q value, Q tot here is lower than the target we're trying to represent, then we use a high weighting of one. If our estimate is overestimating our target, then we use a smaller weight of alpha. So in the paper, we proved that both of these recover the correct argmax and also the correct maximum Q value for sufficiently small alpha. So that's nice. Now that we've covered the weighting, we can describe weighted gimmicks as a whole. And there are three main components to it. The first are Q mix of Q values, Q tot, and this, these ultimately produce our decentralized agents and allow us to efficiently maximize by proposing the argmax action. The second is the weighted loss, which we've argued is important for changing the Q values that QMix learns in order to ensure we can actually recover the correct argmax and the correct maximum Q value. And finally, the last component, which we haven't mentioned yet, is the centralized unrestricted Q value estimates that we also learn. Now, the idea behind this is that we want to learn accurate Q values without worrying about how the weighting is affecting the quality of, your, the quality of our estimates especially as training progresses. And perhaps we can actually learn more accurate Q values if we're not restricted in the structure of our Q. Ultimately, these are just used to estimate Q values for the joint actions that are proposed by QMix. So all of this theoretical work, whilst nice in providing a firm theoretical foundation to build on, is ultimately just meant to serve as inspiration or a guide towards building our deep RL algorithm. Ultimately, we are interested in the deep mile setting on improving performance there. So how can we realize weighted QMix in practice? And a diagram at the top um, is the way that we implemented and tested in the paper. It shows how we compute our targets, the YI, and the two loss functions used to train QMix's Q values and our centralized Q values. And in particular, our centralized Q has the exact same structure as QMix, but it features a simple feedforward network instead of any hyper networks or anything more complex like that. And importantly here, only QMix has the weighting applied to its loss function. Now I mentioned earlier that the idealized central weighting needs to be approximated and in the bottom left is how we do so. So we give it a high weighting if the action is the current argmax that QMix suggests, or if its target is greater than our centralized Q estimate. So in essence, we're trying to approximate if we think this is the correct optimal action. For the optimistic weighting on the right, um, we can use it pretty much as is. If Q mixes Q value, Q tot is less than its target, then we just give it a high weighting. Otherwise, we give it a low weighting as before. Now, an interesting thing to touch upon is the similarities that weighted Q mix bears to an off-policy actor critic setup. So the actor is Q mixes greedy deterministic policy shown here. And the critic is the centralized Q values that we also learn. So weighted Q mix then trains our centralized critic to estimate the Q values of this deterministic policy. And this can also be thought of as an approximation to Q learning since our policy is approximately argmaxing centralized Q values. And the big difference between weighted Q mix and other similar actor critic algorithms like MADDPG or a multi-agent version of SAC is in how the actors are trained. Weighted QMix trains them indirectly through a weighted Q-learning loss that we described earlier, whereas MADDPG uses a deterministic policy gradient theorem. And so before we come to the results, I'll just briefly outline some of the baselines that we consider. So due to the connections we just talked about, we compare to MADDPG and a multi-agent version of SAC. Now, importantly, uh, these implementations that we use are designed to be as close to weighted QMix as possible, with the only real difference being in how the actors are trained. So the weighted Q learning loss versus the policy gradient loss. 
T strand is another very relevant baseline, which also has some quite interesting links to weighted qubits. Specifically, you can view Qtran as specific choices of the three components of weighted cumix. So Qtot is learned through VDN instead of cumix, and the weighting function of Qtran is really quite different to what we use. And finally, another very important baseline is cuplex, which I'll very briefly outline. And the important thing about cuplex is that it can theoretically represent all joint action Q values so it doesn't have any representational constraints like QMix or VDN do. But crucially, it does this whilst maintaining the same consistency that VDN and QMix do. So it's really easy to argmax and get the correct optimal joint action for QPlex. And at the same time, you're not restricted in what you can represent. So theoretically, it ticks all the boxes and it's fantastic. So after all that, um, looking at the weightings and everything, was any of the weighted cumic stuff actually useful or helpful to our final performance? And I think it was, um, especially in the sorts of scenarios in which cumix and related methods fail because of these representational constraints. This is one such scenario, a predator prey task in which the agents are punished for not coordinating when trying to capture prey. So in this setting, you need two agents to try and attempt to capture at exactly the same time step Otherwise, there's a punishment for miscoordination. So weighted QMix solved the task quite easily, um, shown at the top here in purple and blue. Uh, CW QMix and OW QMix representing the two different weightings. Now, in contrast, uh, QMix um, and VDN, which isn't shown here, completely fail because they just cannot represent these kind of Q values, in which there's a significant punishment for missed coordination. Also, quite interestingly, uh, Qplex fails on this task as well, indicating that whilst it can theoretically represent all joint action Q, it might struggle to learn some of them in practice. The other important class of baselines are the actor critic approaches, MADDPG and the multi agent SAC, which also fail here. MADDPG having a lot of variance, um, so you can see a lot of red. And you know, this really suggests that there's certainly a lot of room for improvement in these policy gradient methods. And if you're interested, um, we had some recent work on this, a factorized variant of MADDPG, which we call FactMank. And finally, um, to wrap up the baselines, uh, Qtran also performs quite well here, suggesting that some kind of weighting is really quite helpful and useful in these sort of tasks. Now, one important aspect of weighted QMix, which we haven't really focused on, is the way that it separates the Q values that QMix learns from the data that it's being trained on. So in a deep RL setting, QMix has an implicit weighting function, which is based on the data gathered by the behavioral policy. And so what QMix learns can be quite sensitive to the type and the extent of exploration that is being performed. So the more you take random actions, the closer you might be to a uniform weighting, for instance, which can lead to bad results as we've seen. However, where did QMix through the weighting aims to separate what is learned from the specific data that is being trained on. Now, ideally, our weighting should enable us to learn in perhaps unfavorable situations where playing QMix would fail. The predator prey task was one such example. The point um, I want to try and make in this slide is that the implicit weighting determined by your behavioral policy is quite a hard thing to control, whereas the explicit weighting that uh, weighted QMix uses is very much in your control. You have complete control over it. Um, and this you know, lets you have a lot more flexibility in how you do your learning and ultimately can lead to much better results. And so we test this by increasing the amount of exploration that we performed. So shown here are the results for a SPAC map, uh, 3S5Z, in which, the in which the extra exploration is really unnecessary for all the methods. So what we're looking to see is how well each method is able to utilize the data gathered by their very exploratory behavioral policies really how robust they are to an increased level of exploration that isn't necessary in this kind of task. And we can see that weighted QMix does much better in this scenario than QMix in dealing with more exploration in the setup, which is nice and good to see and validates some of our hypotheses. Now in some other scenarios, um, such as this SMAC map, 6H versus 8Z, the additional exploration can be extremely helpful. Importantly though, you need to be able to take advantage of it. And so here we test weighted QMix and QMix with two different epsilon schedules. 
So the solid lines are with an increased level of expiration. The dashed lines, which you can just about make out right near the bottom, are with a small level of expiration. And we can see that ultimately, the more exploratory epsilon schedules lead to better performance. But in this scenario, only weighted QMix is able to take advantage of this expiration and learn some good policies. Whereas QMix is unable to make progress on this task. And actually, the more expiration it used, um, the worse it seemed to do because it's you know, a solid zero right at the bottom there. Now, of course, um, it's not all sunshine and rainbows. Uh, weighted QMix introduces additional complexity over QMix, which can be quite detrimental sometimes. We have this entire other model. We now need to worry about the centralized Q. And we also have this weighting function, which we need to choose and potentially tune sensibly as well. And we can see that in some harder scenarios, corridor from SMAC shown here, we can have regressions in performance compared to the simpler QMix. So this map is often used to test the exploratory capability of the agents, because otherwise it's quite difficult to learn a good strategy, a good policy, if you're not doing enough exploration. So compared to the other scenario, even though more exploration is being done, weighted QMix isn't able to take advantage of the expert exploration, and it's not able to learn a good policy, whereas QMix is. So in the last couple of slides, we looked at some of the results we had in the paper, but there are more if you're interested. And so kind of thinking about future directions for research, uh, one big area for potential improvement is the weighting function that we use. There's absolutely no reason we need to limit ourselves to a binary weighting. And I'm absolutely sure there are better weighting functions out there that are perhaps designed more specifically with our deep learning setup in mind. Another big area that we essentially know as a bottleneck is the architecture for the centralized queue. So on the harder maps and scenarios, its extra flexibility seems to be holding performance back. And instead, um, we should try and leverage it, its extra flexibility and turn it into a big benefit, a strength of the method. Now, finally, an interesting question I've been thinking a little bit about is why something like QPlex fails in our particular predator prey task. Because theoretically, QPlex can represent all joint action queue, and so it shouldn't have any issues stemming from the representational constraints. But empirically, at least in this task, um, it really struggles to take advantage of that. So here are a list of the papers that we focused on during this talk. Um, first of all, the original QMix paper, which was published ICML in 2018. So it was my first paper, um, and I learned a huge amount from everyone as part of going through the experience, which was absolutely invaluable. We later expanded on the results for much more detailed analysis and the results from the SMAC benchmark that Shimon talked about earlier. This was published in Jimla. And finally, I've been presenting some results from the weighted QMix paper, which was at Europe's last year in 2020. Um, all of the code for these papers is available if you're interested in the setting. Um, in particular, I think it's relatively quick to get up and running and doing research um, because we've open source PyMal and many other papers and relevant methods also make use of PyMal. So it's quite easy to get the code and the official implementations of the methods and really streamline your research. So to conclude, uh, we presented QMix, a simple effective value function factorization method for DeepMal. Our experimental results strongly suggest that the factorization is crucial to good performance. However, the key values that QMix learns can sometimes be inaccurate or unhelpful. But we can remedy this by introducing a weighting function into our loss in order to change the approximation that QMix makes. Thank you. Okay, uh, are we going back to Shimon or are you guys uh, finished with your talk? Oh, we're finished now. All right. <laughs> okay, thank you very much for your talk. Yeah, very interesting. Thank you both, uh, Shimon and Tavish. So we've got some time for questions and um, I'm seeing some hands up already. If you don't mind, I just wanted to quickly follow up with a question just to break the ice, I guess. Uh, Shimon, you had on your slide 22, I think, um, a, a, a like an overall plot that had a bump and then went down again, right? Um, not you, you. You don't have to bring it up again, I guess. But you said something that confused me. You said um, uh, so. You said it, it learns faster in the bump, but then in the end, we can see that it ultimately learns better policies than the other algorithms. But the trend of, I mean, it was a complete uh, downward gradient in the trend, right? So there was no convergence visible at all in in that uh, line. How come you made that conclusion from that downward trend? So the um, 
the y-axis on that plot is, is not absolute performance. It's the, it's the um, number of maps out of 14 maps that QMix had in, uh, a policy that was significantly better than that of the other methods. Okay, I see. That wasn't clear to me. But still, with the downward trend, it looked like that uh, portion would continue to go down, right, without reaching... Well, what am I missing here? So uh, by the time you get to the right point of the plot, all of the methods have plateaued. Ah, okay. So the, I see. The, there shouldn't be any more order changes. The hump in the middle indicates that, like, um, some of the early benefit is just due to learning faster. And then when you come down the hill, the 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 um, advantage that remains over the other methods that's that's um, a difference in final performance. Okay, cool. Right then. Um... That was just my quick question. I think I'll, uh, I'm seeing some, I saw some hands up, but no, the hands up are gone. So uh, am I seeing one here? Uh, Samuel Garcin, you can just uh, unmute yourself and uh, go ahead with the question. Uh, can you? Yeah. Or you can type the question in the chat if that's easy. Okay, while he's uh, while he's doing that, maybe I use the opportunity to do uh, something else. So, uh, yeah, this is very nice work, and um, it's great that you guys are sharing the code. Uh, we recently had a paper ex um, accepted in the NeurIPS Twenty One benchmark. Um, a track where we release an extended version of uh, your PyMar code base. And I just wanted to share this with you. Use this for the benchmark to ensure that the algorithms were all consistently implemented and we added tweaks to how you can do parameter sharing. And I'm, I'm sharing just the archive here so you guys can have a look and let us know what you think of this uh, ePyMar, which uh, builds on your PyMar. So the question now has arrived here. Um, I was wondering if you had compared the performance in terms of wall clock time since the weighted QMix introduces additional computational complexity. Gabish, you want to take that one? Yeah, I guess I can take this. Um, so I don't think we made any explicit wall clock time um, comparisons. Um, in terms of how much far well, slower it runs, it's a little bit slower. But um, since we're using relatively small networks and I guess relatively small batch sizes, everything gets batched onto the GPU anyway, and it's it's not really too much of a bottleneck. Um, but yeah, it, it is a little bit slower, but not significantly so. Okay, we have another question here. Thanks for the talk. Towards the end of the slides, Tabish, you started talking about weighting functions and how those could be further explored. Could you comment further with ideas you had on that? Yep. Um, so I guess I don't have any super concrete ideas about how to uh, extend them. Um, but I guess maybe one, you know, maybe slightly obvious thing is just to have a weighting that changes depending on how good the joint action is. So if we decide to give a smaller weighting to some joint actions, we don't need that to be the same across all of them. So for example, the very worst joint action, we can give a tiny weighting. Maybe the second best joint action, we can give a reasonably large weighting. We can try and vary them dynamically in some way. Okay. <clears throat> Any more questions? I actually wanted to. I wanted to follow up with the wall clock, uh, clock uh, question because I think that's important, and I'm wondering what your thoughts are. So, what I frequently see in the deep RL literature is that people make tweaks by adding complexity but the limit performance is not affected compared to other baselines. You typically just uh, achieve an improvement in transient performance, which you know is labeled as better sample efficiency or something like that. And then I wonder often with these plots that we see, right? Um, as a new tweaked algorithm that's more complex, gets quicker to uh, a better, uh, like to convergence, uh, but the baselines achieve that as well. So one plot that you showed was, uh, I think, where you showed your weighted QMix and then there was QTran and they had to seem to achieve the same limit performance. But what I wonder with these plots sometimes is if you swapped 
um, the x-axis from time steps to wall clock time, I wonder if the ordering would swap because it depends on what your uh, complexity is in these algorithms, right? And how expensive it is to push through the gradients and whatnot. Uh, so you can still make a case that sample efficiency is important in some cases like robotics where experiences are very hard to come by, right? But in other uh, environments, for example, a pure simulation environment where the simulator perhaps isn't the bottleneck, then I think wall clock time is ultimately the thing we care about because we only have 10 hours budget to train something or you know something like that in an industrial setting. What's your take on that? And uh, what would you recommend to sort of address that in, in research? Um, I can take this one, Shimon. Go ahead. Um, so I guess for that specific plot, um, since Qtran is quite similar to the way that QMix, the computational complexity ends up being more or less the same. We're still learning a centralized queue, still have a weighting, still have your actors. Um, and I guess for me, I tend to focus on the sample efficiency since uh, I'm quite interested in, say, exploration um, and that sort of thing. But if you're really interested in the wall clock time of your experiments, then there's certainly a lot of things you can do to improve that. Um, so one thing in particular is just to use a bunch of environments in parallel in order to gather experience um, and then do your training after that. Um, you can get huge, huge speed ups in terms of wall clock time if you do that. And that really dwarfs any of the sort of slight slowness, slight slowness in some of the methods. Um, so you can train you know, maybe almost as fast as some actor critic methods, um, things like Como or Central V, um, just by you know gathering a lot more experience in parallel. If you're interested in wall clock time. Okay, I think I'm seeing another hand up here by a user called Raf P Raf Pi. You can just uh, unmute yourself and uh, go ahead with the question. Uh, hi, thank you. And thank you for your presentation. It was very insightful. Uh, so in, uh, in your last slide, there's an open question saying that uh, studies suggest that uh, the factorization is crucial. Uh, but th th there's this paper also coming from Oxford called uh, Is Independent Learning All You Need in StarCraft? And I was wondering, so, do, we, do you think that uh, it is more important to, to use independent learning in, in further studies to solve StarCraft environments, or do you still, uh, uh, do you, are you still in favor of using uh, centralized training, decentralized execution approaches, uh, like the ones that you have been discussing? So uh, let me say something about that, and then Tavish can add his own thoughts. Um, so, so first of all, just to clarify, whether it's independent learning or not, it's still the same setting, right? The centralized training of decentralized execution, that's like a problem setting that imposes certain rules. You can approach that problem setting with independent learning or with other learning algorithms. Um, the sort of like cartoon version of the history of this field is it like the actor critic methods were proposed first, um, then they were greatly outperformed by the Q learning based methods like VDN and QMix. And then recently, PPO versions of the actor critic methods have been investigated and have upended that ranking. So actor critic methods are like competitive again for the first time. Um, in, the, in the space of those PPO based actor critic methods, it doesn't seem like centralization of the critic is an important factor. So there's this like IPPO, independent PPO, and there's um, MAPPO, which is which uses a centralized critic and they as far as we can tell perform very similarly so the crucial factor there seems to be um the like the uh, the, the trust region constraint which is a, a, a approximately enforced in ppo methods that seems to be crucial to making actor critic methods work a lot better and making them competitive with q learning methods uh at least on the actor critic side that seems to be by far the the dominant factor Tavis, you want to add anything? Yeah, um, I think a lot of these recent PPO um, algorithms have some really strong performance. Um, but I guess in terms of the question, is independent all learning all you need? Um, sometimes it's not. Um, and in some maps where perhaps things like BDN and QMix do really well, they sort of do really badly um, for reasons that we maybe don't quite know yet. Um, but also um, in terms of the implementation details and the sort of difficulty in getting some of these actor critic methods to work, um, there do seem to be a lot more considerations you'd need to take into account um, when you're doing your learning. Mm 
So something to keep in mind in terms of the simplicity of relative methods. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks. I have a question from uh, Ian Sheridan, if you want to go ahead. Yeah. Hi. Uh, hello, um, Shimon and Tabish. Very interesting, uh, important work. So well done. Keep it up. Um, I have a quick question for Tabish. So sometimes ig ignorance may reveal, reveal some innovation. So you just have to bear with me. So why is StarCraft used? What, what's the background to, to why you use that as a benchmark? Um, so I guess from my perspective, it's, I think it's really important to have a deep RL benchmark in the deep mile setting. Um, since a lot of other work sort of focuses on matrix games and grid world tasks, which are really important. Um, but I think it's really nice to have a benchmark that people widely use that does sort of test and stress the scalability of algorithms. And we can see that things like say Qtran, which do really well in um, simple matrix games, or predator prey tasks don't quite scale up in their performance um, when you increase the complexity of the task. Um, so StarCraft was kind of a nice candidate for building out a set of nice tech POM DP benchmarks for this. Got just two quick ideas. I'm just floating ideas. And this is obviously uh, the, the purpose of this forum in part. So firstly, is that you could produce your own game particularly you as you know you're, you're there the cutting edge of originality you, you know Oxford yourself with, with others you could quickly put together a game that, that there may be some advantage to that because you absolutely know everything about how that works in effect you know you've built the laboratory rather than going to, to someone else so I think that could be important and the second thing which I did mention before so excuse if I'm banging the drum but I think sport is really ripe for you guys to look at from a scientific mathematical point of view. You think about this, most professional sport, hockey, sevens, rugby, cricket, the players, they, they are almost robotic in the sense that they, they've got to be, you know, it's, it's five meters, not six meters. They have their positioning is absolutely fundamental. That, that's one of the key differences between professional sportsmen and even semi-pro. So you, you could get a lot of benefit from looking at sport to see where there are these real well-known mathematical formulae. And, and from that, I think you, you could gain a great deal. So just, just those two, two thoughts out there. Uh, I look forward to seeing your game. And also, you know, have a really good look at how humans at a top end are working and, and how that can, can fit in with what you're doing. Um, so just a comment about that. Inventing your own domain, um, I think it's kind of a double-edged sword. Uh, so it gives you a lot more control and it can facilitate a kind of like careful experimental analysis um, that might be harder with more of a black box environment. But the danger, I think, is that you're kind of grading your own homework. Uh, you might be implicitly creating domains that favor your methods. Um, and, you know, I, I wouldn't call StarCraft like the real world by any means. But the fact that it was a game that existed before we came along and decided to do RL on this topic, and that people played the game and it mattered to people actually out there in the real world, that I think makes it much more significant to make progress on it. Um, and, and to ensure that we're building something that actually has some connection to stuff that people care about um, in the real world. In, in terms of sports, I totally agree with you. And I think this is the, you know, the motivation behind RoboCup, which for decades has focused on, you know, of getting both machine learning and robotic solutions to, to football. Um, and there are some recent efforts from Google on this. They have something called Google Football. Um, but, that, hey, Shimon, I, I'm conscious of Mr. Albrecht's time here. So um, consider this, you've got this wonderful forum uh, um, with Turing and all these other universities. I, I'm listening to what you're saying. Yes, you don't actually don't want it to be authored by Oxford. That would be marking your own work. But there's no reason why you can't have an open source piece of a, a game that very quickly probably marries more. And I am guess just floating ideas marries more with industry and that's why five-a-side football or maybe some known robotics game might, might uh, help but I, I certainly yeah collectively you might be able to produce something that yeah you could, could be a, a lot more transparent and illuminating because everyone knows exact, exactly what's in it and, and of course you produced it yourselves as, as a collective if, if it comes from industry I totally agree 
Um, but it's not just about Oxford, it's academics in general. Uh, we, there's, we run a risk of just chasing our own tails. Um, so there's value in external, in, in external domains. But yeah, in, collaboration with industry is a great way to achieve that. Okay, thanks. Are there any last questions before we wrap up? I don't see any hands. I think uh, so with that, um, yeah, I think we can wrap up. So thank you very much again, Shimon and uh, Tabish for your time today and for everyone else for attending. We've got a range more talks uh, coming up uh, for the rest of the year and already some talks scheduled early next year. But if you have a lab in the UK and you'd like to speak in this series, please, please reach out to myself and to Mike Woodridge and we try to slot you in. Uh, it would probably be closer to the summer next year then. Okay, and that's it. Thank you very much again, everyone. See you around. Thanks, Stefano. Thank you.